Yes, welcome back. So this is the final talk in uh, in this uh, morning, evening, or afternoon session, depending on where you are. Uh, before we have a break with posters, um, the next speaker is Christian Pele, uh, presenting joint work with Timo Wunderlich, and he's going to explain to us how we can do exact gradients or event-based backpropagation for exact gradients. I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, so Christian, all yours. Thanks, and uh, thank you to the um, organizers for um, allowing me to speak. So I will be talking about event-based backpropagation for um, in spiking neural networks. But before I do that, let me briefly remind you about backpropagation, which is I assume everyone is familiar with. Uh, so backpropagation is this algorithm which really fuels the current deep learning revolution. So the, all these advances in image classification, vision processing, natural language processing, and so on. And in essence, it's an algorithm that is a message-based algorithm. So there's two phases, a forward phase, during which messages get passed between processing elements, which are typically thought of as like these um, layers. And so, for example, you get a green input to one processing element, and you produce a red output. And you remember the input that you've gotten. And then a second processing element might produce a blue output, and you remember again the input that you had. And then during a second phase, the backward phase, um, you again, in a message passing way, um, compute errors and uh, gradient updates ultimately for the parameters. So again, you pass in um, an error value in the in one of the processing elements, then you compute um, an update to the parameter, and so on. So this algorithm is nice because it scales really well. So you only need a memory proportional to the number of processing elements. And uh, really, most of the computation can be done locally, provided that you get messages which uh, allow you to compute um, the updates and so on. So. In continuous time, um, or like in the context of computational neuroscience, there's really this question of how to best do um, temporal credit assignment. And this is a really hard problem because, as you've seen in the like, even if you think something like backpropagation might help you or guide you to a solution to that, there's really these two phases. And, uh, but more specifically, in the case of spiking neural networks, there's the additional challenge that you have these discontinuous state transitions. So really, there's two issues compared to backpropagation. You have continuous time, and there's discontinuous state transitions. And for I think most people even thought or think that it's not really possible to solve these two problems satisfactory in an analogous way to the backpropagation algorithm. What I will explain in this talk is essentially that there is such a solution namely applying the adjoint method uh, with partial derivative jumps really gives you an exact answer. And more specifically, in the case of spiking neural networks, it results in an event-based algorithm for creating computation with essentially arbitrary neural models. So this is the work uh, that I did with um, Timo Wunderlich in the case of LIF neurons. Uh, we call it event prop there. And it is really precisely an analogous thing to the backpropagation algorithm. So again, you can consider processing elements. These processing elements are now, um, you can think of them as, for example, spiking neural networks. And they receive now events in time and process those to then um, produce output spikes. And similar to the backpropagation algorithms, you need to remember these events and the events that you've produced to then in the second phase, you get um, event-based errors, error information, and compute based on this error information um, an event-based gradient update and potentially errors for any kind of connected other processing elements. So I will explain how this works in more detail now. First of all, the general theory of how to work out um, parameter gradients in continuous dynamical systems, this was something that was interesting to people even before backpropagation was invented, namely in the context of um, analog computers and of optimal control. So before digital computers became really powerful, 
um, people invented all these special devices to, to um, solve particular problems that they had. And to do so, you, one had to have a theory of optimal control of how to essentially in these analog machines, how to adjust the dials, how to tune them to do the task that we want. And uh, one of the pioneers in this was Lev Pondriagin. He actually um, was blind from the age of 14, but he nevertheless managed to contribute greatly to, to optimal control and many other things. And the, the, what he came up with was this Pondriagin maximum principle. And the special case of that is uh, what are called the adjunct equations. So the, the idea is relatively simple. You have a constrained optimization problem and you uh, uh, can arrive, given a, a specific dynamics for your dynamical system, you can arrive at a second set of dynamical equations which um, allow you to compute um, parameter gradients for an essentially arbitrary loss. And of course, as you all know, for example, um, all neuron models are essentially composed of dynamical equations, so a dynamical system. In the case of the LIF neuron model, which we already have seen today, um, it's these two simple equations for the synaptic input and for the membrane um, voltage. But in addition, and that is kind of um, the, main, the main thing that is, makes it a bit more difficult, is that whenever the membrane voltage reaches a threshold value, uh, jumps happen. So in this case, uh, we are considering a model where the membrane voltage just gets reset to zero and you get synaptic inputs um, according to some um, synaptic weights. And this seems problematic because um, it's not quite clear how to then compute gradients. But in fact, this was addressed pretty quickly after this um, theory of optimal control was developed by um, a Russian mathematician uh, named Rosenwasser in, in 1967, and then later essentially rediscovered by other people, by uh, uh, Galan et al. in 1999, for example. Um, the key idea is why it's possible to actually compute, still compute parameter um, gradients is the following. Um, here I sketch um, the membrane time, uh, the membrane as a function of both the weight and time uh, uh, for an input spike that arrives at time t equals zero. So as you can see, as you increase the, um, as you increase the weight, eventually the neuron reaches, a, uh, reaches the threshold and the spike would happen. So the implicit function that you have is you have, a, you have this black curve along which a spike would happen and the, the task is really to compute a, a, a gradient or a, a, a parameter derivative of the um, time at which the spike happens as, a, as uh, in terms of other quantities, namely the membrane voltage. And this is possible because of the implicit function theorem, and you can do it exactly. Furthermore, these transition equations allow you to really um, relate the membrane, uh, the, the a partial derivative of the membrane before and after the jump in a very straightforward manner. Now I come to the main result that we show in this paper. Namely, uh, we show that for a completely general loss, depending both on spike times of uh, and potentially all membrane voltages, we can exactly um, give an expression for the um, parameter derivative of this loss in terms of the adjoint variables of the, um, of the postsynaptic neuron at the spike times uh, of the presynaptic neuron. And moreover, these adjoint variables can be computed very simply by, an equation, by two um, differential equations that look very similar to the original lift neuron equations with the additional provision that you have to solve them backwards in time. Then the kind of thing that, that really makes the method interesting from my perspective is that to compute the um, gradients across at spike times, or, or rather these adjunct variables experience jumps at spike times. 
namely the adjoint variable of the neuron that spiked, the uh, lambda v, uh, receives a jump. All the other ones stay the same. And this expression looks kind of complicated, but it's actually kind of easy to understand. There's one contribution which comes from the if the loss depends on the spike time of that particular spike. And then there's another contribution which basically um, performs the uh, backpropagation in the traditional sense. So all the connected neurons um, contribute to the jump of this uh, neuron that spiked at that time. We can illustrate this in a, in a simple example where we only consider two neurons, namely one neuron that receives Poisson input from a number of Poisson sources and is connected by a synaptic weight to a second neuron. And then we compute a loss, which in this case is just the sum of the spike times um, that the second neuron produces. So here you see in uh, figure B, you see during the forward pass, the first neuron spikes a couple of times. And then the second neuron in response to that um, spikes at these two times. And now the question is how to actually compute the gradient. And as the, the two formulas I showed you in the previous slides give you the answer to that. Namely, you have to solve these adjoint equations backwards in time. So this is what is happening here. And what, this, what, this, um, what these transition equations here tell you is that due to this blue term, the first change in the uh, in the adjoint variable of the second neuron will happen at t post two, and this is exactly what happens here. So this starts to jump up, and then it decays according to the equations that I've shown you, and then then at the second or at the first spike time, because you're looking at it, at it in reverse, it jumps up again. And for the first neuron, what you can see is that as soon as at all the spike times of the uh, at, at all the spike times of the first neuron, it receives itself contributions, jumps to the uh, adjoint variable, which are due to this red term here. And then the kind of amazing thing is that even though um, the gradient computation itself, according to this method, happens in like jumps, it converges exactly to the value that you can compute by finite differences. And here in the upper case, we are looking really at the weights of one of these Poisson inputs, how, the, how it's connected. And you see there's like a lot of tiny jumps that eventually still compute uh, the exact gradient. Now, this was a, just an illustration, but we also looked at two um, tasks which um, illustrate this further. One is um, we use a time to first spike loss and the yin yang data set, which is a essentially four dimensional data set where each point in this yin yang figure is encoded as a spike latency and there's an additional bias spike. And then we have a simple uh, feed forward network and we use this particular loss, which encourages the first spike to. Um, occur for the class that you that you want to classify uh, that you want to I mean you have three neurons in this case there are three classes um, red blue and green and you want to um, classify the 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 points and this loss allows you to do that and you reach comparable accuracy or actually it's slightly better I think than uh, in the original pu uh, publication by girls at all where they introduced this task the, the second task we look at is a voltage, where we have a voltage dependent loss, this uh, max over time loss, which we've, which we've also seen in the previous talk, uh, and we classify MNIST with that. And with a simple uh, feed forward network, again, we reach um, like competitive performance, the kind of performance that you would expect. Now, let me briefly come to some conclusions. What I've talked about is basically backpropagation and spiking neural networks. We've seen that a correct treatment of the spike discontinuities really allows us to compute exact gradients. Moreover, this event-based gradient computation allows us to leverage sparseness in time during training. And I think this is really one of the main advantages of this method. And we've achieved competitive results on MNIST and um, Yingyang. Let me, while the time is running out, let me come to an outlook. 
I think the, the main open things to, do, to demonstrate is really to um, demonstrate this on larger scale and event-based data sets. And that uh, is certainly something we are looking into. And, but on a more like practical level, EventProp also has really compelling properties that suggest an implementation on analog hardware and on analog and digital neuromorphic hardware. And finally, the methodology, I mean, we've, I've shown you this for the specific case of LIF neurons, but this is really general and can apply it in principle to any kind of neural model. And there's by now even tools that do that for you automatically. You, so you don't need to give up your, all your autograd goodness. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to hear your questions. Yes, thank you very much, Christian. Wonderful idea. I, I like the paper a lot when I read it. I think I've read it a couple times now. Uh, I think I also start to understand the point here. It goes way back to physics, uh, I think, with, with the Lagrange multipliers and control. Um, yes. there, there are a bunch of questions. Uh, I think we have, a, we have a bit of time to, to go through them. Um, Tim asks a question about non-spiking neurons. He says, for gradient descent in SNNs, the gradient is often zero. Um, here you use continuous time, so providing a neuron fires an infinitesimal change of input weight will cause an infinitesimal change of latency, hence the gradient of the loss with respect to this weight is probably non-zero. But if a neuron does not fire, then an infinitesimal change of input weight won't cause a spike and thus will have no effect on the loss. The gradient is zero uh, and the input weights will never change. Is this an issue? So I think uh, I think there's like even in the A and N case there's an issue there, right? So if you have relo units and the, the, the relo is dead and there's never any kind of sample in your data set which produces a non-zero output, you have the same problem. So so I think empirically, even like for larger data sets, this has not been really an issue because if your data set um, is like sufficiently large, there's a high chance that that your neuron will produce spikes for some of the samples of your distribution. So you should really think of, since you're not doing like um, your sampling, right? And you're doing stochastic gradient descent, you're really integrating your gradients over your sample distribution in some sense. And that allows you in most cases to sidestep that. Of course, there's like further like stuff that you have to consider. You can regularize, you can encourage neurons to spike by introducing losses that do that. But um, yeah, so I think I think there was waste around that. Yeah, I agree there. I think that's also been our experience. And usually the smaller the network, the more it becomes an issue, or at least the less mm -hmm. data you have. So for big network, it's it's indeed less of a thing. Uh, Tim Tim thinks, um, he also mentions that he thinks this might be where a circuit gradient uh, could help if you, if you have something that pushes neurons up once in a while. I guess that's true. But things uh, yeah, do become easier then. I think the question of how to do regularization well is really still open. And I, I like I brushed over some one thing, which is this there is this um, there is still like critical values at which you have a problem because V dot diverges. And so so there's there's something where you could consider there might be a problem, but I think in practice this really doesn't enter much. Nice. There's also a question from Jamie Knight that, that I, I was also wondering about. Um, he says there there's been some other methods also for uh, for doing back propagation of spike times, like like what Julian Golds or, or Julia Maria Comsa did. Does your mm -hmm. joint method mean that you can use, or how does it compare? And and does it uh, joint method mean that you can use neural models without an analytical inverse? Not quite sure if that's the yeah. correct. Thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a very good question, and that's that's kind of uh, I have like I have like one, yeah. So basically, like if you think about it, right, like computing the time at which a neuron spikes, this is really a root solving problem if you want to do it numerically. So if you have a if you have a numeric if you have a numerical solution, you don't need to have an analytical time at which the neuron will spike. And both Comsa and Girls they rely on an analytical expression for when the neuron will spike. Now the implicit function theorem, the implicit function theorem basically it's, allows you to sidestep that completely because the implicit function theorem doesn't care about an analytic expression. It just cares about 
being able to somehow determine the spike time. And so what you can do is basically, and this is what we're doing behind the scenes, you can just use a root solver and compute the spike time exactly without having any kind of analytical formula for it. So, so there's like, um, I can briefly show you that. There's like um, Himmel, right? So that's a framework that Google um, produces. And they're right now they're using this analytical formula, but you, they might as well use really the, um, the root solver and the implicit function theorem. And then, so that's the connection. Ah, fascinating, cool. I think I have two questions that I can put together and, uh, and, and I will stick to that. Um, Gunnar Blom is asking, does this method work with more complicated, uh, i.e. Uh, recurrent spiking neural networks? And Friedemann is, is adding to that, uh, asking what, what, are, what are things that are preventing scaling for this method? And I think they're related, so I put them together. Uh, yeah, so, so scale, like implementing it for a current neural network is mainly a question of um, like computer code. So you need to write it in a way that it works for recurrent neural networks. The, the method itself works for recurrent neural networks. And scaling, this is something where I, I invested some time in, in NORS, this library that I'm building with Jens, um, to implement a discretized version of this. And there we've seen pretty good, so I, I compared it on CIFA, for example, with like a few million neurons and like a residual network um, to surrogate gradients. And it appears for, like there's like a lot of ca caveats there because, I mean, as you all know, if you have like a, something like CIFA, you can, there's like, we do it for very few time steps. So it's not really spiking anymore, but in any case, so in this case, uh, you get like comparable performance. So there's really no difference. No. Um, so, so I think the scaling up is the recurrent and the scaling up are a bit different because like feed forward architecture, you, you can scale much, much better, right? Like it's like, especially if you don't have many time steps. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's something to look forward to then. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll leave it at this, uh, given for the sake of time and also so people can still get a cup of tea before going to the poster session. Uh, for the posters, Dan just posted the link in the chat. There is a Google Doc with the Zoom links to the posters that people prepared. So please have a look. And um, I'll see you guys then in the Zoom rooms or at 4.30 again when Kat, Katie Schumann is giving the next invited talk. Christian, again, thank you very much for your talk. Thanks. Very nice. And see you in a bit.